Hi friends, welcome to my recap of Watchtower Study Article 35. This is a part, probably about three, of the disfellowshipping series in the infamous August 2024 Watchtower, which was delayed in being uploaded to JW.org. Even September's was uploaded, but August was mysteriously missing. I don't know that we really know exactly why. Maybe we do. If so, leave me a comment. Um, I just have stopped uh, researching that point as to why it was delayed. But this one is very interesting uh, because Watchtower is still in the process of rebranding itself. We know that they have lost their funding they uh, know from Norway, you can do an internet search of it and see uh, re they lost their funding due to their shunning policies, very harsh treatment of its members who no longer want to be Jehovah's Witnesses or who have broken their rules. And now in this lesson, this is entitled help for those who are removed from the congregation i've said this many times watchtower in actuality tells their followers exactly who they are but it's hidden in plain sight because most of their followers read only these articles they do not put the scriptures into context and that's what we're going to do in this video. We are going to ex uh, dissect this article and our only weapon will be the Word of God. All right. So friends, thanks for tuning in. Let's dive into it. Notice the song that they sing is called Loyally Submitting to Theocratic Order. There are the lyrics just to the left. What's in the white box? Theocratic order they must all obey. I've also highlighted in yellow they will sing god provides his steward and his active force i want you to know this phrase active force is not scriptural the bible makes it very clear that the holy spirit is not impersonal he grieves he comforts he convicts do a word study of the holy spirit in the bible and you'll see this phrase term active force actually comes from hermeticism which studies the secrets of the cosmos it's from hermes and it's from the egyptian god thor according to the focus jehovah's witnesses will learn why some individuals need to be removed from the congregation and how elders can help such ones repent and be restored to jehovah's favor notice the theme right luke 15 7 there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents then over 99 righteous ones who have no need of repentance. This is very interesting. God is speaking to the Pharisees. He had, Jesus had just finished the parable of the, uh, of the lost sheep. And he's explaining why he needed to eat with sinners. Because those people are lost. They've, they've done things to separate themselves from God. The Pharisees feel that they should be shunned. Jesus feel, felt that they needed to be saved. They needed a shepherd. And if these Pharisees who called themselves shepherds were shepherds, in essence, they were bad shepherds, according to uh, Ezekiel 34. They believed that the purpose in socializing with righteous people is to look and be more righteous. They want to build their reputation. They believe that publicans and sinners need to be denounced and shunned. Isn't that amazing? That watchtower is using Luke 15 to say that joy shall be in heaven over that one sinner who the Pharisees felt should be shunned. Jesus said, Rescue that one sinner. Don't shun him. Jehovah is not a permissive God. He does not condone sin. He requires that respect his righteous standards, which he has set forth for us in his word. But he does not expect perfection. Look at Matthew 5. What did Jesus say? What's underlined? Think not that I have come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill 
Romans 10, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Christians are declared righteous on the basis of Christ's fulfillment of the law. Why? Because the law was a schoolmaster to show us why we need a savior. If you broke just one of the laws, you've broken them all. Nobody could do that. Christ did. Watchtower, however, Jehovah's Witnesses are required to respect these righteous standards. Is that a good thing? Yes, to respect righteousness. Yes, but they can never attain to righteousness. That's the difference. In the box, Christian elders imitate Jehovah as they patiently try to help wrongdoers change their ways and be restored to Jehovah's favor. However, not all wrongdoers respond favorably. Isaiah 6, 9, friends. There it is in context at the bottom. You can read that. It's not about God patiently waiting for wrongdoers to change their ways. Isaiah 6 is a declaration of judgment on those who refused to hear God gave them over to blindness. Under the subtitle, remove the wicked person in the box. In a sense, the wrongdoer has chosen that consequence. He is reaping what he has sown. Why can we say that? Because he has refused to respond to repeated attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. 2 Kings 17, there it is in bold. 2 Kings 17 is a verse about Israel serving idols. They fail. You see it in red there? They fail to cite verse 16. They also cite Galatians 6, 7. There it is at the top in bold. Talking about whatever a man sows, he shall reap. Look at verse 8, what's underlined. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. What is this talking about? It's talking about the born-again Christian, the one who has died to sin with Christ and has raised to new life in the Spirit as Christ was raised. Born-again Christians, those who have turned to Jesus as their Savior, do not live in the flesh. They are a new creation. They live by the Spirit. When they do things that displease God, there are consequences for those things things, but they don't live in the flesh. They live in the spirit, friends. Their sins are forgiven. Their sins have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. When an unrepentant wrongdoer is removed from the congregation, an announcement is made to inform the congregation that it's no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. The purpose of that announcement is not to humiliate the wrongdoer. Yes, it is. I have to interject. If you saw my recap, I think it was of 33 or 34. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's this announcement that needs to be made to the congregations. Nowhere does the Bible say that the person has to wait outside, which was what it used to be. I don't know what it's like now until the congregation has settled down, is all seated and quiet, and then they walk in. It's a shaming tactic. It is definitely made um, to... Uh, humiliate the wrongdoer. What's underlined in orange, rather it's made so that the congregation can follow the scriptural admonition to stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with him. That direction is given for good reason. Moving down the next box, it says, unrepentant wrongdoers can weaken the determination of those who are trying to live by Jehovah's righteous standards. Notice Romans 10, 4 in orange, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. They also cite the verse that they love, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do you see that? Be not deceived, bad association, evil communications, corrupt good manners. I want you to to read 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in it. And therefore he says, how can this be? The resurrection that it was something definitely that took place when he resurrected bodily. So in that sense, and I told this to a family member 20 years ago, the ones who need to read this verse in context are the Jehovah's Witnesses because they are the ones who do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he raised bodily from the dead. 
Paragraph five, how then should we view a fellow believer who is removed from the congregation? Although we do not socialize with him, we should view him as a lost sheep, not a lost cause. A sheep that is strayed from the fold may well return. Remember that lost sheep dedicated <laughs> himself to Jehovah. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to dedicate yourself to a God who has an organization. Sadly, he is not living up to that direct dedication at present, and that puts him in a dangerous position. Nevertheless, as long as Jehovah's mercy is available, there is hope that the person will return. You can read Ezekiel 18. It's talking about God telling Israel to cast away your transgressions, your idolatry, and turn to me. It's not talking about casting away people. Paragraph 6. Is the individual who has been removed from the congregation abandoned, left completely on his own to find his way back, Jehovah, by no means? Next box. If the wrongdoer is willing to meet with, the, with them again, the elders will at that subsequent meeting make a warm appeal for him to repent and return. Even if he has not had a, had a change of heart at that time, the elders will make periodic efforts to contact him in the future. Do you think any person who has been interrogated in a judicial committee Tomato, tomato, as a reminder in the, the Watchtower's rebranding of itself to make itself more friendly, judicial committees are now called Committee of Elders. The elders strive to reflect Jehovah's compassion. Moving down in the box, in imitation of Jehovah, Christian elders genuinely want the wrongdoer to return, and they do not make it difficult for him to do so. Jeremiah 3.12, there it is. But I want to show you Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. You see, God loved us so much that while we were as we were, as we are sinners, he sent his son to die. All right, paragraph 8. Recall Jesus' parable of the lost son. When catching sight of his son, returning home, the father ran, embraced him, and tenderly kissed him. Notice that the father did not wait for his son to beg for forgiveness. Rather, he took the initiative as ever, any loving father would. Jehovah's feelings towards repentant wrongdoers are expressed at Hosea 14.4. I will heal their unfaithfulness. How will he heal their unfaithfulness? Which the actual verse in the King James says backsliding. In Hosea 13, the chapter before, in orange, it says, In me is your help. I will be your king. Verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. Well, what is this talking about? Who's the king? You know who the king is. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, right? That resurrection chapter. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For he must reign, because Jesus is the king. Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Galatians 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So in Hosea 13, 9, it says that I will be your king. Verse 14 says, I will ransom you from the power of the grave. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the king. Jesus is the redeemer. And Jesus put an end to death. Talking about Jesus. Jesus is the only answer. Not the elders looking for interrogating an individual to see why they did what they did and how it felt and how long and whether they're going to do it again a year later after they've been faithfully attending these ridiculous meetings. Jesus is the only answer. Paragraph 10. What about individuals who in the past were removed from the congregation perhaps many years ago? Such individuals may no longer be practicing the sin for which they were removed. In some situations, they may not even recall why they were removed. Whatever the case, the elders will try to locate and visit these individuals. Nobody ever visited me. However, I willingly left. Just to make that clear, I willingly left, we're talking 38 years ago, 38, yeah, 38, and then after the fact, they refused 
to read my letter that I was leaving and they um, disfellowshipped me on a bogus claim, a matter of hearsay. I left willingly, but they said they removed me. In the purple box, of course, if a person has been away from the congregation for many years, he would no doubt be very weak spiritually. Therefore, if he indicates that he wants to return to the congregation, the elders might arrange for someone to conduct a Bible study with him, even though he has not yet been reinstated. Paragraph 11, what's underlined? The door is open for them to come back. When a sinner manifests re repentance and abandons his wrong course, he can be reinstated without delay. Okay, just to be clear, what's happening here in 2 Corinthians 2 is different than what happens in the book of 1 Corinthians, where Paul um, reprimanded the church for allowing the incestuous relationship. This is completely different. There was a, an influential man who challenged Paul's authority as, uh, a, as a, an apostle of Christ, therefore rejecting his message. And Paul was concerned that the congregation um, had sided with this man. Read it for yourself. You'll see, I just wanted to um, make that very clear. And in the verse that they cite, he says, forgive him and comfort him and confirm your love toward him. You have to understand, there's nothing, nothing about being reinstated, right, at, at all here. That's the key. When you read these verses in context, you'll see they mean something completely different. In certain circumstances, the elders need to be especially careful before reinstating someone. For example, if a person was guilty of uh, what's underlined in red or apostasy or if he schemed to end the marriage, the elders would want to be sure that he is truly repentant and how do they do that? How do they read the heart? They must protect the flock. At the same time, we need to realize that Jehovah will accept back any wrongdoer who shows genuine repentance and stops engaging in wrong conduct. You can read the rest of that. Can you believe this, friends? Look at this. The Australian Royal Commission, the Washington Post headline, Australian Jehovah's Witnesses protected over a thousand Members accused of CSA report says, look where the red arrow is pointing. Some say church covered up all of it for years. They did. I'm not getting into this. It's all over. You can just do an internet search and they have the nerve to print this in their magazine. Of course, because their members are not allowed to look at any type of news headline having to do with Jehovah's Witnesses because according to, was it David Splain, all of the news um, outlets are, are liars. Well, yeah, some, okay. We're not gonna get into that. Um, all of the articles, anything about them is all a big lie. Court cases, judges, lawyers, they're all out to get the witnesses. That's what the leaders say and scare their followers half to death. There's more pharisaical rules regarding a person who is reproved versus removed. Read the verses. See if the verses they cite have anything to do with the offices of being reproved versus removed. You will not see it. Does what we have considered mean that we should completely ignore a person who has been removed from the congregation? Not necessarily. Certainly, we would not socialize with him, but Christians can use their Bible-trained conscience in deciding whether to invite a person who has been removed from the congregation. Perhaps a relative. Don't socialize with a relative or someone they were close to previously to attend a congregation meeting. What if he attends? In the past, we would not greet such a person. Here again, each Christian needs to use his Bible-trained conscience in this matter to even say hello. Some may feel comfortable with greeting or welcoming the person. However, we would not have an extended conversation or socialize with the individual. Can you believe that? More division. Just remove their 
entire social structure of family and close friends who may have had their eyes opened by God to see that they're in a cult. Some may wonder, doesn't the Bible say that a Christian who says a greeting to such a person becomes a sharer in his wicked works? Read 2 John 9 through 11. We're going to stop there. There it is. Whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ. Do you see that? We're not talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Verse 10, if there come any unto you and bring not the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that bids him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Back to the paragraph, what's underlined in red. They claim the context of the spirit scripture shows that this direction refers to apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. Therefore, if a person is actively promoting apostate teachings or other wrongdoing, the elders would not arrange to visit him. Of course, there's hope they don't come to his senses. Until that happens, though, we would neither greet such a person or invite him to attend a congregation meeting. What is the doctrine of Christ there up at the top in red? John 17 in green tells us that thy word is truth. John 1, of course, tells us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. In purple, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You don't get to God through an organization. And of course, 1 John 4, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. This is the doctrine of Christ that he is the way, that he is the truth, thy word is truth, and that he is the only way to get to God, and that he came in the flesh. So anybody who does not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, they abide not in the doctrines of Christ. So who are the apostates, the real apostates of scripture? Certainly not Christians. I'm called an apostate. I am, in fact, an apostate of the Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Yes. And that's why they shun me. Not because I am an apostate of the doctrine of Christ, according to 2 John 9. So here you go. You can read this box. Basically, I'm not going to read it. It's commenting on apostate computer blogs or social media equates with sharing in their sins. Jehovah's Witnesses are scared to death. They're scared to death that they might by mistake read apostate literature. And if by mistake they even do this or try to read it to defend their own faith, they're sharing in their sins. Unbelievable. All right, and there's 16 and 17. Um, they just kind of recap what this um, article that is full of lies tried to manipulate their followers into believing and studying and shunning. 38 years I've been shunned. I don't even know the third and fourth generation of my immediate family the fourth generation. There's only one of my siblings' children had a child. So out of five nieces and nephews that I have, who are now adults in their 30s and 40s, there's only one. Fourth generation. It's very sad. I have circuit overseers and Bethelites and elders and regular pioneers throughout my immediate family. And their belief system is not based on the doctrine of Christ. It's based on the doctrine of Watchtower. And I pray for them. And I've been praying for them for more than two decades. Continue to pray for your loved ones, friends. Continue to move forward in truth. Don't allow Watchtower to have any more 
of yourself, leave them in the dust. I know that's hard to do because their shunning policy is absolutely brutal. They are just like the Pharisees who imposed burdens on their people by adding to scripture, by manipulating the law and the commandments and the rules, by putting rule upon rule upon rule that the people could not follow. I appreciate so much you turn you tuning in, friends, and turn to Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He died to save you. Um, he, he redeemed you from the curse of the law, and he's the only way to God. Thank you for watching, friends, and I hope you have a great day.